Well, good morning. It's my privilege this morning to say welcome and welcome to North Oaks Baptist Church. This is a great day to join together in worshiping today. I just want to welcome you here today. Uh, so if you'll stand with me now. Our first hymn this morning is takes from Psalm 118.24. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So let's do that this morning. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. If you please be seated, let's sing together now. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Thank you. 
Chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. That light of love, His mercy reigns. I am in love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns. I am in love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve as snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God will be here below, will be forever mine, will be forever mine, will be forever mine. If you had the privilege a couple of weeks ago to attend the Singing Men of Texas concert that was here at North Oaks Baptist Church, uh, Bill and I hosted this group, and uh, we were so glad we are part of that group. And uh, Bill is one of our soloists in the, in the group, and he and I both love this next song that he's about to come and share with us. And Thank You for the Blood is the title of the song. And Bill, thank you for coming and sharing with us today. Is when we sing, but I want to ask you a question now. Uh, this is I'm not preaching. I'm not preaching. I sing, but I love the Lord, and I want to ask you, and you don't have to answer out loud, but answer to yourself: Who is your neighbor? Think about it. Who's your neighbor? On the way to church this morning. I wanted to say something before I sang, and I didn't know what to say, to say until this morning. We were on our way to the church, and we were coming down Luetta, and I, my wife knows I'm a kind of perceptive person, but not as perceptive as our security people. They're, they're real perceptive. And I noticed a gentleman on a bicycle on the side of the road. I don't know what he was doing. But my first impressions when I drove by, you know, he had a mohawk and a lot of tattoos, you know, and my first thing is like, oh, this guy. But my wife noticed that his bike was broke down. So immediately the Spirit of God said, I'm probably supposed to go help him. Now, I was early today, so I didn't have, I wasn't that Levi, you know, that Levi guy walking by. And saying, oh, I got to get the, I got to go do what I got to do. And, and um, so I was thinking of the security of my wife and putting this guy in my car and trying to put a bike in. I had already things in the back. Needless to say, I passed by and I got convicted that I probably should have done something. And that is what the Holy Spirit does to us. There are people that always come into our life that maybe after they pass by and we didn't do anything, we get convicted. Well, I thought, well, maybe that's it for the day. And then we go and stop and have breakfast uh, at uh, Whataburger. And again, I saw somebody pass by me going to the restroom with a sock cap on, usually you wear when it's cold, and a jacket. And I thought, well, maybe he has that on because it's cold inside the building, but it's not cold outside. And when he came by, I watched him, and then he walked, and he gave me a look as he passed by my, my little booth I was sitting in. And I go, that's it. That's another one that crossed my path today. And I looked, and I saw that he was going outside, so apparently he was homeless, and he came in to use the restroom. Now, I thought, I missed that opportunity. 
but I didn't because I went back up to the register to get something else and I saw him standing outside. So I'll say he was homeless. He was well-educated, mechanical engineering. He's Jewish. He knows Jesus Christ. I invited him in to have breakfast. He wanted to know why, and I didn't. I wanted to explain, but I said it's kind of my duty, you know. I, you're probably hungry, so he sat at the table. We prayed. He wants to go back to Israel. You never know who you're going to run across, and he told us his story. And he said. He was in Saudi Arabia working. His wife told him to come home. He said, it was, was it important? She said, yes. His son had been killed in a head-on collision with a truck or something. And he said, from that point on, I gave up on life. Now, I don't know how long ago that was. But he goes to a church. Oh, I asked him if we could drive him to church, but he goes to a church. I thought, I am a wretch. I'm always a wretch. I'm not good. And wait till you hear what Jesus does with the blood of Christ. I need some more on the monitors if I can. Right here. Yeah, that's probably better. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. You broke my chains, freed my soul. For the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. But I've been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. For the blood applied, thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that 
calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, the blood. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by our Father through the blood, oh, the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus. You have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Sing with me, with your eyes closed, with your eyes closed. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. No instruments. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Now you can open your eyes and sing it again. Glory to His name. Just worship as you sing it. Just keep worshiping. Hallelujah. Glory to His name, and all God's people say, Amen. We're going to sing a new song uh, that's new to us, and maybe new to you also, Cornerstone. It takes its, some of its words from the old Solid Rock hymn but uh, combines it in a new chorus and stuff. So let's sing together this, together that song. <clears throat> My hope is built upon nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy be of Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of Darkness fills his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, we in the Savior's love, through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found. 
Rest in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. As he lives is our next song. Let's sing it together. God sent his son, they call him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lives, I can face tomorrow, because He lives, all fear is gone, because I know He holds the future, and life is worth the living just because He lives. I'll cross the river, I'll fight my spot, no war with pain, and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I know he lives. Sing it out now. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How great thou art is our next song. Oh Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all Words thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God is some not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, when I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about the mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing love. Thank you, be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now, Lord, ask your blessings on Brother Nathan now, Lord, as he comes to share with us in message. Lord, we just pray that your word would come alive today, Lord, that your word would penetrate deep in our hearts today, Lord, that we would be changed as we leave this place today, Lord. But we pray your anointing on him. We pray, Lord, that your your spirit, Lord, would just speak to his heart today and that he would uh, share the message that you have for him today, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for all that are here today, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to worship you and sing in song today. And now we just pray, Lord, that your word, Lord, would touch our hearts as we look to your word now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Am I on? You got me? Okay. 
Okay, as we, am I on? Yeah, I'm on. As we um, announced last week, uh, the pastor search committee has focused on a man of God that would be here this morning, and he is. And we uh, welcome him uh, with uh, open arms. And um, Pastor uh, Nathan uh, Davis, Dr. Davis, uh, you all in your bulletin, you have a, quite a bit of information about him. He has um, actually uh, been involved in many, many more things than what you see uh, in there, uh, in the bulletin. We, uh, the committee had a, a wonderful time yesterday visiting uh, with him and the family. I have to uh, apologize that um, unfortunately last night um, McKinley got very, very sick during the night. And so Melanie and McKinley could not make it this morning. So we pray that uh, whatever that uh, malady is would pass quickly for her. But uh, Pastor Nathan and uh, Reagan are here this morning. If you have not met them, you'll get a chance uh, afterwards out in the uh, foyer. I want to read um, Psalm 10, just one uh, verse, sorry. Um, Psalm 40. Didn't mark it. Sorry about that. 46. <laughs> pastor Ed has, um, uh, that's our uh, interim pastor. He has mentioned this <clears throat> particular verse, and he's, uh, he's said very many times. He said it from the pulpit, and he's also said it to us uh, at our coffee meetings and uh, also in Wednesday night, Sunday night, and whatever. But Psalm 46, verse 10 and I happen to be reading from the New King James. I know we usually use the NASB. But it uh, reads, uh, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. And that is exactly what we want this morning as we pray for uh, Pastor Nathan. We welcome him uh, with open arms. He is our uh, the candidate that we have, as our search committee, has focused on. So let me uh, pray first, and then uh, we'll hear the message from Pastor Nathan. I asked him yesterday, what does he like to be called? And he said, whatever you choose. So if you want to call him Dr. Davis, Dr. Nathan, Pastor Nathan, Pastor Davis, he responds to it all lovingly. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you this morning. Um, Father, I thank you for that wonderful solo, praising you from Bill. I pray, Father, for this time now. I pray for Pastor Nathan as he brings your word. Um, in John uh, 17, um, John 17, verse 17, uh, Jesus uh, prayed to you, Father, to sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And that is what Pastor is going to be preaching on this morning, the truth, your word. I pray, Father, that you would bless him mightily. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit the power of the Holy Spirit would be upon him as he brings the word to us this morning. And I pray, Father, through it all that you would be honored and glorified. We worship you, almighty God, and we thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross. In his name we pray. Amen. Pastor Nathan. Thank you, Brother Fred. Are y'all glad to be here today? About three or four of you. Are you glad to be here today? I think this is a great place to be. So far, everyone's been kind and gracious to my family, and so we're just excited to be here and to be a part of this worship service today. And uh, didn't the choir do a wonderful job today? Let's just give them a round of applause and all those that helped out. Well, I'll get right to it. 
I love to preach God's word, and the Lord called me to preach at a young age, and so I've been preaching ever since. And I was thinking about it today. I can't recall a time when Melanie and I were not in a worship service together. Wherever I am, she's usually there. And so uh, if I'm a little distraught today, just don't hold that against me, okay? She's usually amening me over there, or maybe she holds a sign up and says, don't chase any rabbits. But we are glad to be here with you today. The last words that someone says is always important. Uh, When I was living in Marshall, Texas, I had just graduated from East Texas Baptist University, and I was going to Southwestern Seminary there. They had an extension there uh, at East Texas Baptist University. I had a dear friend of mine by the name of Dr. Donald Potts. Uh, He was my mentor and one of my professors, and uh, he was chairman of the religion department at East Texas Baptist University. He taught at Southwestern, and so... We had a very good relationship with each other, and uh, one Saturday night, I came home, and uh, my wife, Melanie, said, Dr. Potts says, it doesn't matter what time you get in tonight, that you need to come over to his house, and I said, well, that's interesting. No matter what time it is, I said, it could be 11 o'clock or 11.30, but she said, it doesn't matter what time you get in, you need to go to his house, and so I said, okay, so I went over there to his house, and Uh, He used to uh, be able to move around in an electric wheelchair, and so he was not able to walk like most of us are able to do. But he needed me as I walked into his bedroom. He said, Nathan, I need you to go get a box out of my closet because the doctor told me I only have two weeks to live. I didn't think much about what he said, and so I went to go get his box out of the closet there, and then it hit me. He said he only has two weeks to live. And so I went back into his bedroom there, and I put that box in front of him, and I said, Dr. Potts, I said, we need to talk about this two weeks to live. I said, what's going on? He said, well, the doctor told me today, Nathan, I only have two weeks to live. And I said, Dr. Potts, I had tears in my eyes. I said, Dr. Potts, how do you feel about that? And he said, Nathan, I've been waiting for it my whole life. It's like graduation. He said, I'm looking forward to seeing my wife and those that have gone before me. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ face to face. And so I said, Dr. Potts, that is wonderful. And so I said, I want to be with you every step of the way to just have this experience with you. So his daughter called me and we found out that he was going to be preaching his last sermon at First Baptist Marshall. And she said, Nathan, would you be so kind as to record that last sermon of his that he's going to preach? I said, yes, ma'am, I'll do that for you. I'll record his last message that he ever preaches here on planet Earth. So I went and I recorded his message there. It was a wonderful message. And so a few days more went by and they wanted him to come and speak to the students there at East Texas Baptist University. And so his daughter said, well, Nathan, will you record his last message to the students? And so with a video camera, I recorded that last message. And then he lived on a little bit longer, and so he was preaching at another church, and she said, well, would you go and record that last message he's going to preach? I said, Cindy, I'll do it for you. And so time would go on, and on and on. And Dr. Potts didn't live just two weeks. He lived for six and a half years. And he was one disappointed man. And so when he passed away, his daughter Cindy said, he has some things for you. And uh, you need to come by his house and pick up some things like preaching books and commentaries, and he had a filing system for every chapter of the Bible. He would put information for every chapter of the Bible. And he would leave me all of his sermons that he preached. And they hoped that one day they would be published. And so like any preacher would have a tendency to do, I started thinking, well, out of the thousands of students that he's had over the years, I must be pretty special for him to leave all this stuff to me. 
And so I was with his daughter, and we was loading the stuff up into boxes, and, and I was always waiting for Dr. Potts to give me his last words, and, and he did die suddenly, so I didn't get to hear his last words, but as I was loading all this stuff into boxes, stuff that I would use over the years, she said, Nathan, he had something that he wanted me to tell you. And I said, okay, here it is. I said, out of all the people, he could have given this to anybody, but he chose to give it to me. And she said, he thought that you would probably think that away, so he had some words for you. Nathan, he left these things to you because he thought you needed all the help you could get. <laughs> I said, you have got to be kidding me, Sandy. That's his last words to me. And so one day I can't wait to see Dr. Potts and say, all that stuff you gave to me, it really didn't help me a whole lot. But I did the best I could do. So today we look at the last words recorded in Matthew's Gospel by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So take your Bibles and find Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now, when it comes to the final words that Jesus would give to his apostles and those that were surrounding the, the end of his ministry, those final words matter. And Jesus establishes something there that we should make sure that we don't forget. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Most of the people that I know today don't really like authority. In fact, we resist authority. We want to reject authority. But Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Throughout this passage, you'll notice the word all. And I don't know about you, but when I see the word all, it means all. Not a little bit, not some, but all. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he says something that I want us to recognize today and apply to our own personal lives. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now, in our English translations, it usually just uses the word go. But literally, in the Greek, it reads, as you are going. It is a participle with continuous action. That means if it's continuous action, it does not stop. It keeps going. And so, church today, we must be going. We must be going. You can't even spell the word gospel without the first two letters, G-O. You have to go. Now, most people, if we're being honest with one another, we get comfortable where we are. We like to stay instead of go. But when God commands you to go, you have to go. And you never know where you may end up going if you're obedient to Jesus Christ. And so as you are going, you have the responsibility to be telling people about Jesus Christ. As you are going, you recognize, as Bill mentioned to us, those moments, those God-ordained moments where you can be a witness to someone, where you can tell them about Jesus Christ. And I would say to you today that most churches that have a growing problem have a 
going problem. They think, well, that's simply what the pastor will do or what the staff will do. That doesn't apply to us. We don't have to go. As Adrian Rogers said, most people think that they can come sit, soak, and sour instead of serve. But God hasn't called us to be pew potatoes. He hasn't called us to just sit there. He's called us to go. And we have that responsibility. Now, most of us, to be honest with one another, we don't like to go. Some people would say, well, I'm not a person that likes to express my feelings and be outward focused, but rather inward focused. I want to tell you that I know that when a church becomes more inward focused instead of outward focused, it will eventually die. Now, you may find that a tough pill to swallow, but I've been in a lot of different congregations. I've been around a lot of people, and I've been in services where you can sense that the Spirit of the Lord is moving and working, and there's vibrancy, and there's enthusiasm, which means in God. And then you go to those places where you're there for an hour, and it seems like a year. Now, you don't want this church to be like that, do you? You don't want people to, as soon as they get here, they're looking at their watches to see, what time are we getting out of here? Sometimes church worship services are the only places where I notice where people get somewhere in a hurry to want to leave in a hurry. I heard a pastor say one time he was thinking about these hour-long church services. And I'm glad to know that you've extended it to at least an hour and 15 minutes. But he said, who ever came up with an hour-long church service? And he said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to that guy that came up with that hour-long church service. But he said, the more he thought about it, he realized that he's probably not there. <laughs> we must be going. Secondly, we must be baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing is a participle there with continuous action. It was just reported recently that in 2022, those Southern Baptist churches that turned in their annual church profile, 43% of them did not baptize one person in an entire year. You know, that breaks my heart. That makes me sad. To think that even the pastor of the church in an entire year could not lead someone to Jesus Christ. But you know what? It's a sad commentary on where we are today. But every soul matters to Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that at a young age, when I heard the gospel being preached, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And even though someone may have said, well, he's too young, he doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, absolutely, I knew what I was doing. And my life has never been the same. And so we baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward faith. Baptism doesn't save one person. But it's important, and Jesus modeled that for us when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. If you want to just remember that, just remember Triple J. Jesus baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. It was important to Jesus. It lets people know that we have a relationship with him and we have surrendered our life to him. And we see the Trinity there, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit how important that is to see the unity among the Godhead. One of my friends was telling me about a baptism that he had. It was off in this country church, and he said this guy, he was an older man, got saved, and he was excited about the Lord, and he said he baptized him in his overalls. He said he dunked him in the water, because that's what baptism is. It's immersion. 
he dunked him in the water, and he said when he dunked him in the water and brought him up, he said the cigarettes started floating on top of the water. He forgot to take his cigarettes out of his overalls. So he said, I just baptized those cigarettes too. He was still working on sanctification. You know what I'm talking about? He just got saved. And so he was realizing what it means to surrender his life to Jesus Christ and never be the same. Everywhere that I've been, we've seen people baptized. When I was interim pastor in Texas City, not long after I had got there, someone got saved. And so I told some of the guys in the church, I said, get the baptistry ready, we're going to have a baptism. When I told them that, their eyes were as huge as golf balls. I said, what's the deal? Why did you react like that? They said, pastor, we haven't baptized someone here in about four and a half years. I said, are you kidding me? They said, it's worse than that. I said, I don't think I want to know. They said, we've been using our baptistry, are you ready for this, for storage. I said, you clean that baptistry out. We're going to start seeing people saved, and you just watch what the Lord can do. So they cleaned it out. We started baptizing people. That means people are getting saved, surrendering their life to Jesus Christ. And people were excited about that. So let's just make sure that we're all on the same page here. We all must be going. This command here to make disciples is not just for the apostles. It's for every believer in Christ Jesus. We must be baptizing That means we must be a faithful witness for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means it's our responsibility. We can't hire it out. We can't pay someone to do our witnessing for us. Every one of us has a story to tell, and it's the greatest story to tell about what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. It's the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He resurrected the third day, and He's alive. And He lives. And because He lives, we tell people that Jesus is alive. He's not dead. How many of you believe God's not dead? How many of you believe God's not dead? I'll tell you this. God's not dead. He's not even sick. He is alive, and He is working in our lives, and He should have complete control over our lives. So, we must be going, we must be baptizing, and then listen to this. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching. Now, the word that I go there is teaching. We have to teach people what the Bible says. You may be surprised that some people think that they know a lot about the Bible, but you start asking questions of people, and you'll find out how little they actually know about the Bible. I had an experience with that one time. Some guys were kind of giving me a hard time in the church, and I said, I got a little exercise I want you to do. They said, okay, preacher, what is it? I said, you seem to know a whole lot more than I know about the Bible and how the church should be run and operated. I said, I want you to just write down the first five books of the Bible for me on a sheet of paper. They looked like they had just seen a ghost. One guy came up with about two or three. The other guy said, all I can come up with is Genesis. I said, so you want to question me about what the Bible says, and you can't even write down the first five books of the Bible. We need to teach our children at a young age the books of the Bible. We need to teach our children at a young age to memorize the Bible. My children have memorized the Bible. They've they've learned the books of the Bible, just like I did when I was growing up, and I'm thankful for the instruction 
that I received, from my Sunday school teachers, from my pastor, and for people that invested in me. And so we teach, listen to this, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching is continuous. We teach people the importance of the Lord's Supper and what it is and what it isn't. We teach them how important it is to be obedient to Jesus Christ and His sacrifice that He made for us. One of my friends called me in one Sunday night after church and I was in my study and I was just spending some time with the Lord and he called me and he was very frantic. I said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm going to get fired by my pastor. He was the executive pastor at a church. And I said, you're not going to get fired. I said, what did you do? He said, well, let me tell you what happened tonight. He said, we were having the Lord's Supper at the church. He said, the deacons that were filling up the, the cups, they ran out of grape juice. So they sent me down to the Walmart that was just right down the street. And he said, I ran into Walmart, I grabbed two bottles, and then I brought it back to the church. He said, it was dimly lit in the sanctuary, and they just poured those two bottles into the cups there. And so he said, we had the Lord's Supper that night. He said, the pastor and I were standing to greet people as they were leaving the service, and he said, one lady came through, and she said, did that grape juice taste funny to you? He thought, that's just one person, no big deal. Another man came through and he said, that grape juice tasted funny to me. He said, about three or four people came through saying, that grape juice tasted funny tonight. So he thought, well, I'm going to check and see maybe what happened. So he went to the trash can where they had thrown those two bottles away and he discovered what happened. By accident, he grabbed one bottle of grape juice and another bottle of prune juice. I said, brother, it's going to be an experience they will never forget. They will remember that the rest of their lives. What they thought to be grape juice was prune juice. I said, so you didn't do that on purpose, did you? He said, no. I said, well, you don't have anything to worry about. But you may not want to tell them it was prune juice. So, we teach people the importance of all the things that Jesus has commanded us. You know, some people believe the Bible is inspired in spots and they get to pick the spots. They look at their Bibles and they like some things the Bible says, but then some other things, they don't like it. And so they say, well, I'll do that. But then they'll look at other things and say, well, I don't have to do that. Oh, yes, you do. It says all the things that Jesus has commanded us, we must do. And so we are to be going. We are to be baptizing. We are to be teaching the full counsel of God's Word, whether if it makes someone upset or not. We preach and teach all of it. Now, we may sometimes disagree about certain things when it comes to certain interpretations, certain passages, but in unity, we can come to an agreement that we're going to say and do everything that the Bible says for us to do. And then the commandment is this. As you are going, make disciples of all the nations. Make disciples of all the nations is the imperative. That is the commandment. The word nations is the word ethnos. It's the word that we get for ethnicities today. We have been commanded by God to take the gospel to all the nations. We teach our children at a very young age this song. I won't sing it for you. You can thank me at the end of the service today. But we teach them, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Red, yellow, black and white. They are precious in His sight. 
all ethnicities are precious to Jesus Christ. When we come to the cross of Jesus Christ and we are making disciples, it is for all the nations, for everyone. That means, my friends, that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord can be saved. Jesus died for everyone. And so we recognize how important it is to share the gospel with people and to make disciples. To be a disciple means to be disciplined. Are you disciplined in the way that you live your life? And let me ask you this. If people are watching how you live as a disciple of Jesus Christ, if they model your character and your behavior, would people look at them and say, that's a disciple of Jesus right there? Because a disciple reproduces disciples. So I want you to ask yourself this question today. It's a tough question, but it is a very important question. How many people have you told about Jesus Christ? How many people have you had the personal experience of leading them to Jesus? Maybe even outside your immediate family. How many people have you led to Jesus? How many people are you wanting to see become disciples of Christ and to, to learn and to be more like Jesus every day of their life? How many people in your own life have you seen that happen to? Now, I can almost guarantee you I know the answer to that. Because most places that I go, most experiences that I have with people, and the questions I ask people, we're not telling people about Jesus. We're not making disciples because sometimes we're not even sure what we believe ourselves. But a disciple reproduces another disciple. And when Jesus gave them the experience, the apostles, that is, of spending three and a half years with him. He discipled them. He taught them. They sat at the feet of Master Jesus, King Jesus. And then when he died and he resurrected, they took that message that they heard and they spread it wherever they could. All but one apostle died a martyr's death. Would you be willing to die for Jesus Christ? Would you be willing to die to get the message to someone? Oh, my friends, if you're a true disciple, you will honor him by the way that you live your life. He gives a promise there. He says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry about what people may say about you or what they may even do to you. Because Jesus said, I'll always be with you. Isn't that a blessed promise? To know that he will never leave us or forsake us. He's always there with us. I'll share with you one last story today. My own personal experience. Honestly, I've attended church my whole life. That's how my parents raised me. That's, that's all I've ever known. I'm thankful for parents and for people that have poured into my life. One day, I was at the church, and I noticed that as they dedicated this building, that one of my uncle's names was engraved on the side of the building. But I thought that pretty interesting because he never comes to church. But yet his name is on the outside of the building. And so I began to talk to him and ask him to come to church with me. And, and he was living in the, the ways of the world. He would drink. He had difficult relationships that didn't 
work out. And I would talk to him and I would say, please go to church with me. He said, Nathan, one day I'll try to go with you. I said, your name is even engraved on the building there where we go and worship Jesus Christ. He said, I know I used to go to church when I was little. And so I would try to encourage him and he said, Nathan, I'm just not sure. Well, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he was in the hospital in Jacksonville, Texas, and I was talking to my family members, and they said, Nathan, you need to pray hard for your uncle. He's probably not going to get out of the hospital. He's probably going to die there. And I remembered praying for him just about all night. Lord, give him one more chance to trust in you as his Lord and Savior before it's eternally too late. Plead it with God. A few days went by, they gave me the good news, your uncle's going to get to come home. God has already worked in his life. I said, that is awesome. Praise the Lord for that. I had gone off to college and I was still praying for him, and one weekend I went home, I was on the porch of my mom and dad's house. One of my uncles had just got through visiting with him and he was driving by, and he saw me on the porch, and so he pulled up, and he started talking to me there. He said, Nathan, I think today may be the day. He said, you need to go and talk to your uncle, who was a neighbor of ours. You need to go talk to him today. So I called my pastor and told him, I said, will you go with me to my uncle's house? I said, we're going to share the gospel with him. Maybe today will be the day that he receives Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He was probably in his mid-60s at the time, and so we went over there and talked to him about Jesus, and oh, I could tell something different about him. And I asked him, I said, Uncle Lloyd, that's his name. I said, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? He said, Nathan, I absolutely would. And right there in the middle of his living room, he got down on his hands and knees. I was just looking at him, and all of a sudden he goes down to the ground. He gets on his hands and knees. So guess what I did? I got down there with him. And I said, you can pray a prayer after me. A prayer doesn't save you. It's surrendering your life to Jesus that saves you. Admitting that you're a sinner and trusting in him, that's what saves you. Or you can pray as you feel free to do so. So he prayed, and I prayed over him. And after I got through praying, I had tears running down my eyes. I looked at him, and he had tears of joy coming down his face. And I could immediately see the difference in my uncle's eyes that he had surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. You know what that taught me? I was on the verge of giving up on him. I said, God, when are you going to save him? When is this going to happen? But in God's divine timing, in God's divine plan, he gave his life to Jesus. And you may not feel what I feel about those experiences, but I am confident that one day I'll see him face to face. And when I preached his funeral service, several months later, I said, this would have been a different service had he not given his life to Jesus Christ. My pastor would go over there and he was bedridden and he would read him the scriptures and he'd say, Nathan, he's changed. He's listening and trying to comprehend what I'm telling him. He's changed. I said, yes, sir, I know. So today, dear friend, are you willing to be obedient to the Great Commission? It takes every person doing their part. We are to be going. We are to be baptizing. We are to be teaching. We are to be making disciples. So I want you to stand at this time. Brother Kelly's going to come and we're going to have a time of invitation.
And let me just say this. Used to, used to, when you would give the invitation, people would be out down at the front praying, seeking the face of God crying for family members and friends. But nowadays, they think that's just something that we do to kind of go through the motions before we get ready to go have lunch. But today is the day. Today is the day that you do business with Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus today. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Your life will never be the same. But maybe some of you today, let's just be honest, you need to repent and ask Jesus to forgive you because you haven't been obedient to Him in doing what He's commanded you to do, and that's to make disciples. You haven't been obedient to do what He's asked you to do, and that's making His name known to whoever will listen. As we sing, you come to do business with Jesus Christ. All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender. To Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all, I surrender all. To Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender
hope that you have been convicted. I hope you have been challenged today by this message. Uh, we all need to be sharing our faith with people and uh, being good examples in all we do. I, I was a bad example yesterday at AT&T store. I, I, I blew my witness yesterday. I, I got mad because <clears throat> they were not doing what I felt like they needed to do. And I blew it. You know, I left knowing that I did. So we all need to be a witness to where we are and what we do and be careful about how we do for things. Let's join together, join our hands and hearts together as we sing our closing chorus, Make Us One. <clears throat> Let your love flow so the world 